Hello and welcome to the good old days of radio show. This is John Tefteller, your host. We are um, winding through and kind of almost winding down our special salute to the great first lady of suspense writing, Lucille Fletcher. And we have uh, one, two, three, four more to go. Today's episode is The Search for Henri Lefebvre, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And we also have back with us again our special guest for this series, Don Ramlow, who was friends with Lucille Fletcher back in in her elderly years and is going to um, tell us a little bit more about this than I know. So welcome, Don, back to the good old days of radio show. We're ready to go again. Do you have anything to say about this show before we play it? Uh, Not at this point in time. No, I did have conversation with uh, Lucille about this, and I'll share her comments when we get to the end of this. So, but that this particular episode, I did talk to her a little bit about. So it'll be fun to share with everybody uh, what she had to say after we get through listening to it. Well, great. Now I should tell the audience that this is at least the second time this was done. The first time was on the suspense show itself. Um, I think it was a couple years earlier, actually. I don't know the exact broadcast date. But instead of having Orson Welles in the title role uh, for suspense, they used Paul Muni. And um, I've heard that one. This one my producer dug up someplace and says it's really great. And so we're going to all hear this together for the first time. Uh, Orson Welles, Mercedes Mercedes McCambridge. And, of course, music by uh, Lucille's then-husband, Bernard Herrmann. Uh, It was broadcast on the Mercury Summer Theater. Um, Orson Welles did the Mercury Theater originally back in the 30s, and then because it was such a popular thing, even when he became a mega star with Citizen Kane and the Magnificent Ambersons and things like that, he still loved radio, and he would still return to radio, and they still would slot him in when they could to do a series of radio programs. And this happens to be called the Mercury Summer Theater because it was done as a summer replacement for something else. I'm not sure what, but they gave him the platform um, for the summer, and this one was from July 12th. 1946. So here we go with Lucille Fletcher's story, The Search for Henri Lefebvre. Good evening. This is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon, the Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight and every Friday night, Blended, splendid, Pabst Blue Ribbon presents you with a front row seat at one of the greatest plays ever produced. And now is America's most famous producer, writer, director, Orson Welles. Our story tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is an original for radio by that most original of radio writers, Miss Lucille Fletcher. Its title, The Search for Henri Lefebvre. Mercedes McCambridge will be heard as Madame Lefebvre, and so that our story may move without interruption, there'll be no between-acts intermission on this broadcast, our sponsors having very kindly omitted their usual commercial message at that time. So right now, before we get started, let's give Jim Amici a chance to say his say about... About blended, splendid, Paps Blue Ribbon. Friends, as you relax in the comfort of the summer evening to enjoy Mr. Wells' exciting radio drama, I hope that right beside you... On chair, arm, or table is a tall, frosted, foam cap glass of Paps Blue Ribbon. Believe me, the makers of Paps Blue Ribbon are doing their best these thirsty days and nights to supply your dealer and thus supply you with all this truly great beer you'd like. Occasionally, conditions make this pretty difficult, but of this you can be sure. Every bottle you do get will be, as always, the happy result of blending never less than 33 fine brews into one great beer. As always, 33 fine brews blend their individual taste tones to give you that splendid flavor, not too light, not too heavy, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with the real beer taste coming through just the way you like it. So please keep right on asking for it. It's sure worth asking for. Blended, splendid, perhaps blue ribbon. And now, Orson Welles and his own Mercury production of the search for Henri Lefebvre. I 
had just set down the last note on paper. Do you know what it is to write a piece? The agony, the drudgery, the exultation. To rest the thought out of the drab days of rain. To hear music in one's head. While outside the drizzle patters down and the heads of the mountains are shrouded in mist. And then, one morning it comes. It is spring in the branches outside the window. The mountains glitter. The air is blue and bright. And the melody comes into your heart and nestles close, as though it had always been there. A fever consumes you. Hours melt away at the piano. Time people mean nothing. The world revolves around this rocking song, this tender magic. There are no terrors, save to break the spell. So it was with this piece. I had just set down the last note on paper. I was happy and weary and full of peace. I lay down on the sofa to relax before Miss Warren brought in my supper. There is a radio near the couch. That night, I turned it on. It does it. Horror crawls upon me sometimes out of the shadows, like an animal thing. It grimaces at me from the corner of my room. But this time it was upon me. It was in my brain. For that music on the radio, playing now, was the music I had just set down on paper. Miss Warren! Miss Warren! Miss yes, Warren, Mr. Flynn. Come here, listen to this thing. You hear it, don't you? That is real music playing. Yes, sir, the radio's playing real music. It is not an illusion, an hallucination of some kind in my own brain. Oh, of course it's real music, and very pretty, too. Pretty? Oh, you don't like it? We'll turn it off. No, no, then. leave it alone. Listen to it. Sit there beside the radio. I'll get it for you. What, sir? My score, my score. Here, here look at it. Note for note, even as they play. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Flynn. I can't read music. I don't understand. Perhaps someone in this building has heard me playing, but... No, no, the orchestration is the same. The orchestration is a secret, quiet thing that one does alone. Perhaps they've stolen the score or someone has copied it. But I only finished it this afternoon. It has been here in this drawer and on the piano. Unless... Unless someone else, there is someone else. Someone like me with my brain, my soul, my genius, a kind of double, kind of double. It's over now, sir. <laughs> Do you want me to turn it off? No, no. No, no, see what they announce. See what they dare to say. You have been listening to the elegy for Orchestra Opus 42 by Henri Lefebvre. This concludes... Henri Lefebvre? Henri Lefebvre? Huh? Huh? Henri Lefebvre. After she left, I sat there staring at the freshly written pages. My brain was reeling. It was my music, every little note, every turn of phrase. The silent radio faced me like a mocking, sardonic sphinx. Adolphus, my good fellow. Oh, Picard, excuse me, old friend. Miss Warren, did you call the broadcasting station? Yes, sir. And what did they say? Calm yourself, what my dear What did fellow. they say, they Miss said... Warren? Oh. Oh, Mr. Picard, I'm afraid. They said, Adolphus, that it was composed by this Henri Lefebvre. An old piece. He wrote it nearly 15 years Fif ago. 15 years ago? But I finished it today. If, if I had remembered it, Picard, even in my own subconscious, it would have flowed out like a dream, but I had to struggle. Look at these erasures and these cuts, this colder. Mm. And you say it was 
Exactly this way on the radio. Exactly, as though they had copied out the parts in the twinkling of an eye and an orchestra was reading my score. Very strange, The man either still... stole my piece somehow or... Well, there's some terrible coincidence, some simultaneous crooked streak of identical inspiration that leaped across the Such world. things don't happen. Fifteen... Fifteen years ago, they said. Fifteen years ago. He set it down. And finally, like a, a wave traveling slowly across a boundless ocean, it came to me. Adolphus. Who is this Henri Lefebvre? He was a rather a famous composer. But what's happened to him? Is he still alive? I don't know, Adolphus. I'm not a musician. But could you find out for me soon? I suppose I could, but do you really think it wise? What good would it do you to see this man, this perfect stranger? I must confront him, do you hear? There is some horrible linkage between this man and myself, some string vibrating in his brain, which has caused a like vibration in my own. I must find him. I must somehow break the spell. And supposing this Henri Lefebvre is dead? Dead or alive. I, I, I must find him. I must find him, Picard. I must find him. Henri Lefebvre, born 1885, Rouen, France. Rouen, France. Educated at the Ecole Normale. Ecole Normale. Fellowship student in composition, the Paris Conservatoire. Paris Conservatoire. One Prix de Rome, 1908. <sighs> Do you want me to go on, Mr. Flynn? No, 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 Miss Warren. These dictionaries tell you nothing. They make everything smell of dust. Dust and corruption. Adolphus. Oh, Picard. I have a letter from his publishers. He's still alive. Thank God. But there's some mystery about him. They wouldn't give me his present address. What do you mean? They say they haven't heard from him in ten years. His musical output has ceased. He submits nothing, doesn't answer their letters. Then how do they know he's still alive? Well, they hear occasionally from Madame Lefebvre. Madame Lefebvre. He has a wife who lives in Rouen. Madame Lefebvre. Rouen. Word came at last from the Red Cross. Home of Henri Lefebvre in Rouen, destroyed by bombs. Whereabouts of composer and Madame Lefebvre, unknown. He's alive, I tell you, he's alive. Oh, what if he were dead, I would not feel it. I would be free. But I cannot take up my pen, I cannot write, I cannot even think one thought without wondering whether it may not already be his. How can you think such things, Adolphus? This poor, hounded, homeless man is probably ill, old, dying. Even, even dying is reached out a hand to clutch away my genius. Picard, was I ever lazy? My musical outfit has been enormous. Symphonies, operas, tone poems, songs. Now what do I do all day long? I stand at my window and stare out at the mountains. And at night, I am... Tortured by visions. Vision. Nightmares. Nightmares. Nightmares of crooked foreign streets and church steeples and bells. Bells run by clockwork, the bells of tolling the hours. I dream of rooms, dark, ugly little rooms and a little girl. Yes, a little girl. With long, honey-colored hair. Who cries and cries. You have been reading too much, Adolphus. Your brain is no, tired. No, 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 don't you understand? These streets, these rooms, that little girl, it is his life of which I am dreaming. It is Rouen. You think me mad, don't you, pick up? Mr. Picard? Yes? There's a lady downstairs to see Mr. Flynn. A lady? She says she heard that Mr. Flynn was making some inquiries about her husband. Madame Lefebvre. Adolphus. Madame Lefebvre, bring her up. Bring her up at once. I stood quite motionless in the center of the room. A woman dressed in black 
confronted me across the waste of polished floor. She was thin, middle-aged, a little stooped. Her pale eyes looked washed out with crying. Yet there was another look in them, a look of some drowned and monstrous terror. I am Cécile Lafevre. I have heard that you are searching for my husband. Yes, madame. Why do you wish to see him? Why do I wish to see him? <laughs> you have not heard of my strange predicament, madame. And what of your husband? My husband remained in Switzerland. Switzerland? He has lived there for many years. But why? I thought they said your home was in Rouen. Rouen was my home. My husband and I have been estranged for the last ten years. Oh. You, you've not seen him for ten years. Do you know his opus 42, his elegy for orchestra? I do. When did he write it, please? About... Fifteen years ago. Fifteen years ago. Then you would know the music when you see it. Is this the piece, madame? Yes. I wrote this music, madame, a month ago, out of my own head. Impossible, monsieur. Impossible, but I tell you, it is so. But how could this be? This is my husband. I remember the night he wrote it. A hot midsummer night. The windows were open. We could hear the bells of Rouen ringing the hours. He could not sleep. Our little daughter had been crying. Your, your little daughter? He rose from his bed saying that his head ached. A little while later, I heard the piano begin to play softly. I called down to him and warned him not to waken Louise. Louise. Our little daughter, who Louise. had been crying. Yes. Then I fell asleep. Next morning when I woke up, the bed was empty. He was downstairs at the piano, writing out the final chords. Go on. He said it was her piece. It belonged to Louise. Louise. And that he had been thinking of her crying all the time he set it down. It was as though all the sadness that was in his love for her had gone into that melody. Sadness? But I still don't understand. I wrote this music out of beauty, out of... Spring sunshine and wind and birdsong and joy. My husband used to say this piece held in its heart all the horror of life. Horror? He could never understand why it was so popular. He did not want to publish it. He hid it away saying it was like a premonition. That it had come to him from some... some other world like a hideous omen from another world. And he was right, monsieur. How do you mean? Our little daughter, Louise. She died a little while later. Madame Lefebvre. Yes, monsieur. I beg your pardon for crying. I do not want to see your husband or hear this music ever again. My search is ended. Do you believe in ghosts, madame? No. I have been through too much to believe in poor, sad ghosts. Oh, but I, I do... I believe that neither your husband nor myself wrote that piece. There is some further horror, some demon force at work in this music. It captured him. It has captured me. I do not know. My husband was always a wretched, melancholy man. Tell me, Madame Lefebvre, did your husband write any music after he wrote this piece? Not much more. You mean it wrecked his brain as it has wrecked mine, leaving him without inspiration? No, no, it was not that. He continued to write. He still writes, but nothing he has written for ten years has had any meaning. What do you mean? Mr. Flynn, have you not already guessed the truth? My husband has gone mad. He mad. has been mad for the last ten years, shut up in an asylum in Switzerland. Oh. I have told this to very few people. It is a form of horrible neurosis, work neurosis, the doctors call it. He seems to have lost his heart. The events of his past life are meaningless to him. He has forgotten Rua. He has forgotten me. He has forgotten our little dead Luis. Oh, how terrible. Now he sits in a bare room and writes music all day long. He has become a slave, a machine. 
They tell me that his shelf is packed with scores, but all of them are only an endless jumble of notes, notes such as a child might scrawl across a paper. And, 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 and it was the music, the ghost music that did this. Who knows? Terrible things happen. The mind snaps. Terrible things. If I told you I should betray my husband, I should tell you something which has never passed my lips till now. But you, you, you must tell me. You, do you not see how vitally important it is to me? I am linked somehow with your husband. And perhaps I too am destined to, to, to go mad. No, no, monsieur. You must not think such things. There were the seeds of madness in this thing, even from the beginning... There was something uncanny. Why should that radio play that music just after I had finished the piece? Why should you, you, a perfect stranger, have come here and found me? Mr. Flynn, believe me, people do not go mad so easily. To be destroyed as my husband was destroyed, one must have deep sadnesses and love. One must have human ties, a wife, a beautiful little child. You have no such ties, have you? No, I have no ties. I have no ties. My husband went mad because he loved too much. When our little Louise died, he thought that he had killed her. She died of simple pneumonia, but he could never understand that. He became insane with grief. He thought he was a murderer. Don't you see, Mr. Flynn, you who live here alone, whose life is so quiet... Madame. Madame Lefebvre. I beg your pardon? I have seen you before, Madame Lefebvre. I must... I have met you somewhere. I have heard your story. You have come here before. No, I have never come here before. Then... Then why should your face seem so suddenly familiar and your words? There's something uncanny about this thing, madame. For a, mo for, for a moment, I thought I knew. You knew what? I thought I knew you and your husband and Louise. Louise. I thought I had... I'd lived. <laughs> hmm. Maybe it was only in one of my nightmares, but somehow... I try, try to remember. Please. Remember. Remember. The little house in Rouen, hmm? the stone house, the tree in the garden, the coffee on Sunday afternoons, the Beckstein piano by the window, the bedroom with the calico curtains, the little... The little doll carriage <laughs> underneath the stairs. Louise's doll carriage. <laughs> Louise. Louise! Bobby. What have they done to her? They've taken her away and I've killed her. Her little doll carriage waits at the bottom of the stairs. But she'll never come back. Never come back. No, no, no. She has been dead for ten years. You must not think of her anymore. No, no, no. You are getting better now. Dr. Picard says you are getting Doctor. well. Doctor Picard. Your doctor, darling. What are you talking about? I have no doctor. Don't you see? Don't you see, my darling? Your long search is over. No. You are Henri Lefebvre, huh? and your own music has come back to you at last. And little by little, it will all come back. Uh -huh. Your memories, your genius. You will be able to go out into the world again. I... I am Henri Lefebvre. Yes, darling. I... 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 <laughs> shriveled old madman. No... Huh? I locked up in the walls of a lunatic asylum for ten years, writing a jumble of notes like a little, like a little child. Then, who, who is Adolphus Flynn? A name you made up, my darling, a poor mad name. My symphonies are rubbish, you say. My adoring public are only shadows running across the walls. And these mountains beyond my window, these mountains. <laughs> you are lying to me! Marie. I tell you my name is Adolphus Flynn! Look, Marie, look! This room, these bare white walls, these bars across the window, this door one cannot open from the inside. For ten years, aren't we? For ten years I have waited. 
for a glimmer to come, for some little memory like that music. For ten years I have prayed for, for you every day. For ten? ten years. That's what I said here. I, I do not believe it. Not to be gone. Are we, my dear fellow? You call me Ori too? I cannot tell you how happy I am, Madame Lefebvre. The experiment has worked beyond our fondest hopes. Picard. Am, 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 am I Henri Lefebvre? Yes. I have been mad for ten years. You deceived me for ten years. Not deceived you, my dear fellow. We only humored your whims, hoping that you'd snap back someday. It was your whim to think that you were a composer named Adolphus Flynn. Your whim to sign your name to all these scores. Your whim to live utterly alone and work all day and half the night. You were quite happy, until one day a little piece you'd composed for your daughter long ago came back into your mind. Memory began again. You began the search for your lost self. Naturally, after ten years, one cannot be cured overnight. But you will see, in a few months, we may hope for something quite remarkable. Monsieur and Madame Lefebvre. Him. 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 In a few months. In a few months. In a few months, he said. In a few months, I would be able to go back. I would... I would take up the threads of my old life as Henri Lefebvre. I'm still here. Here in this room, with its bare white walls and its door that locks from the outside. I'm still here. Although I know now for sure that man, that man, that man, that my name is Henri Lefebvre. <laughs> the sadness is in my heart. An unutterable sadness and pain that I can never conquer. Rouen has come back. The stone house, the little doll carriage underneath the stairs. And my arms ache with the longing for a little dead child. With long, honey-colored hair. <sighs> there is no music in me now. No music save that one tune which sings in my head all day long. My song for Louise. If I could only get it out of my mind, I might be able to work again. I might be happy. <laughs> as, 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 as I, as I once was happy. I might look out of my window and find a symphony and a sunset on the mountains. That is why I will not go back. I will not leave this room. I will not leave this room until I find him again. Until I find Adolphus Flynn. You've just heard Orson Welles' Mercury production of The Search for Henri Lefebvre, a radio play by Lucille Fletcher. Mr. Wells will be back in just a few seconds to tell you about next week's offering of the Mercury Summer Theater. But first, 
A few words from our sponsors on a very important subject. The makers of Paps Blue Ribbon are holding their prices at the levels established by OPA last month. Also, ever since government price control ended, they have urgently counseled each household distributor of Paps Blue Ribbon throughout the country to do likewise. Further, the makers of Paps Blue Ribbon strongly urge beer retailers all over the country to do the same. For we believe it's up to all of us to do our utmost in the battle against inflation. And now, Mr. Wells. Well, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we're bringing you the first radio show we ever put on the air for CBS. We haven't done it since. We look back at it fondly. We hope our memories uh, aren't mistaken. We hope you'll enjoy it. It's a great favorite everybody's childhood, and I don't think anybody ever outgrows it. The Great Tale of Adventure by Robert Louis Stevenson, Treasure Island. So join us next week, please, same time, same station. Until then, speaking for my sponsors, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, and for the whole Mercury Theater, including, as usual, maestro Bernard Herman, who was responsible, as usual, for the music on tonight's show, and speaking for Mercedes McCambridge, who was responsible for... A very fine performance as Madame Lefebvre. For the whole gang, I remain as always. Obediently yours. <laughs> This program came to you through the courtesy of the Paps Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, makers of blended, splendid Paps Blue Ribbon. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Well, <laughs> yeah, that actually was magnificent, Orson Welles. Um, I like Paul Muni, but I like Orson Welles better, and I think Orson Welles is better suited to this role. What do you think, Don? Well, for me, uh, the first time I heard this uh, particular play by, by Lucille, I heard the Paul Muni v version, so I still kind of have a fondness for that version, although they're both excellent, and as you mentioned, Orson did such a spectacular job. Uh, this I did talk to Lucille about uh, when I was in contact with her at times, and I had mentioned to her that I really loved the Paul Muni version, and she said, well, he did a great job, but she said the Orson Welles version is the, my favorite. She says he act, actually did everything exactly the way I hoped to hear it, and she thought his uh, particular version was the best of them. Well, I would agree with her. I mean, Paul Muni's great, but I thought this was just over-the-top great. So, yeah, well, whatever. I mean, I, I heard the Paul Muni one years ago, too. That was the first one I ever heard. I'd never heard this before, but glad it survived. There was a little bit of disc hiss in there that kind of faded in and out. That's from somebody playing the transcription disc with the wrong needle and carving a layer of hiss into portions of it. Um, so sorry about that, but we can't help that, and there's not much you can do to get rid of it either. Uh, I noticed that the announcer on the show is Jim Amici. Uh, wasn't he Jack Armstrong, the All-American boy? Sure was, <laughs> uh, among many things. You bet he was. Okay. You know, about it. And I should mention that in the uh, earlier suspense version in 1944, uh, instead of Mercedes McCambridge, they had Lorene Tuttle, another great actress who played uh, the role of uh, Lady Lefebvre. So, okay, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember okay. that. I know Lorene Tuttle. In fact, I knew Lorene Tuttle, uh, and I know the show, but I don't remember. I can't make a judgment on that, whether she was better or Mercedes McCambridge. I do like both of them pretty much equally, so they probably did an equal good job. For those uh, younger folk who don't know who Mercedes McCambridge was, and I guess you even have to be a little bit older to know this, she was the voice of the devil in The Exorcist, the film The Exorcist. Don, are you still there? Yes, I am. Oh, did that okay. come in throw you? <laughs> oh, okay. No, I, I just was trying to see where you were going with it. I wasn't uh, going so anywhere. I'm just making a statement. <laughs> I try to I try to tie these things into younger people because most people go Mercedes McCambridge. Who in the world was that? But if you can say the voice of the devil in The Exorcist, some of them know that. Exactly correct, and of course, 
the Mercedes then went on the road uh, later in life and toured all over the United States. And uh, I had a brief chance to interview her uh, many years ago when she was doing a play, nothing of any real importance. But uh, I'm also very fond of her talent uh, as an actress. So well, she know, gave uh, she gave very few interviews. Do you have that on tape? That I do not. It was oh. just a brief phone call when she was doing a play in Detroit, and I had an opportunity to uh, communicate with her. And so okay. that was it. She was gracious enough to send me a, uh, a photograph signed by her for my collection. Anyway, um, that was a great show, and we will be back next Thursday for another um, of our salute to radio writer Lucille Fletcher, and we will have Don Ramlow back with us next Thursday. So until then, tune in on Tuesday for comedy, drama, and variety, and back here for the Good Old Days of Radio show on Thursday of next week. This is John Tefteller saying goodbye. (laughs) 